This is the last event on Sunday night at Conscious Life Expo. Everybody yell, scream, and raise your arms. You can do better. Come on. Live stream. Yeah. So please, the last event of the weekend. Get loud. Conscious Life Expo 2018. David Wilcock and Corey Good. Come on up. So let's just open this up now, Corey, and I'm going to hand you the remote in just a second. Um, when, you, when you started to have these beings appear in front of you, neither of us had any idea at the time that this was related to anything Egyptian, right? No, no way. I, it was really, really crazy because if you've, I'm sure you've all, most of you are familiar with the story, but Corey gets brought back up into this alleged secret space program, a base on the moon that our government apparently has built. And again, I'm doing this as like a two-part thing, so if you saw the Emory Smith talk last night, it's really essential, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's pretty essential that you see both if you really want to get this. So now, I am going to hand the remote to Corey, and this is our grand update that brings it right up to the present of everything that he has been working on, and it is totally amazing. So Corey, take it away, buddy. Thank you. And this is the remote that you used you gotta hit your, the button on the your right. first year yeah. at the Conscious Life, 13 years yeah, ago? Yeah, it's the same one. <laughs> <laughs> so this started for him in December 2017 with this weird thing with Oumuamua. Except I can never remember Oumuamua. Okay. Right. And it means messenger, right? Yeah. Interesting correlation. So the first known interstellar object passes through the solar system. And this was occurring during the time period that people in the secret space program were aware of an energetic barrier being around the solar system that was preventing things from entering or leaving for a period of time. They were watching this, and they had been watching it for a while, and they were wanting to observe it when it hit this energetic barrier because they wanted to see you know, exactly what would happen. They were shocked when it passed right through the region that they knew the energetic barrier had been. So this meteor, I guess that they were calling it, was sort of a, I guess it was a messenger to let them know that the solar system, that you know, they could now pass through the barrier. And yeah, we talked about that. And have, I think we've... Yeah, hit it again, and you'll get the words coming up. Well, okay, I thought this was the animation. Okay. So the secret space program flew a shuttle out to this object. They knew that uh, from its tra trajectory that it had been around, they knew which star it had been around, and it had been in an orbit that was over a billion years. And the orbit decayed because our star, because of celestial mechanics, started moving through the galaxy in, in a way that tugged at the other star, and it pulled this um, object away. And then they, the secret space program had been watching it come in for some time. Now, what was found on board, there were technological little uh, treasures that they found, but what was the most interesting thing was that they found ancient glyphs and writing, which was more important to them than finding technology, to be honest, because they were fairly sure that this device or ship belonged to the ancient builder race, who are a race that disappeared nearly two billion years ago. And the archeology span that they were finding on the moon and Mars 
was identical to the architecture, ancient architecture they were finding in the local 52 stars, or actually the local 12 or 13 stars that they were exploring in the beginning. They were finding these same types of ruins, but no writing. It's almost as if in history how a king will take over another kingdom, he'll move in and remove the writing and the history of that ruler. It seemed to be something very similar, except the most ancient non-terrestrials that we were in contact with didn't know anything about them either. It was a mystery to them. You want to take this Keep one? Hitting it because we got the bu okay. bullet points there. All right, and according to the law of one, Ra claimed that his soul group had come from Venus, correct? Yeah, this is one of the really amazing things is the law of one describes pyramids being built by this culture that they were originally from on Venus 2.6 billion years ago. And I had been looking for the longest time about anything having to do with a 2.6 billion year old civilization. And Corey, without even knowing it was in the law of one, is telling me about this ancient builder race that they've dated to be 2 billion plus years old. It's a stunning correlation. So David had been speculating the whole time that the Blue Avians were, were related to the Law of One somehow, but I wasn't buying it. I wasn't, I wasn't on that train yet. Right, I know. Um, and I wasn't able to read the Law of One. I mean, I had read through it, but when I was trying to read it, the words would kind of hover above the page and I just couldn't observe them. I mean, absorb them. And, uh, but that changed, it was at Contact in the Desert two years ago. I was in my cabin and I started hearing a chorus of voices saying that we are the messengers and facilitators of the one infinite creator. And I had been trying to read the Law of One, and I had it in my, in my backpack and I went and I pulled it out and I was able to read through it. And uh, I've only read it once, but it was at that point that I thought maybe, you know, you might be onto something. And since George already spilled the beans the other day, that was simultaneous with when I first got together with my wife, as yes. we're now going to be announcing on Wednesday. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I was observed to it. I was there to observe that entire magical union. That was pretty cool. And we'll do more on that when we get on the radio and talk right. about that, yeah. So let's see. So around that time, I received a message that I should prepare for a meeting at the Lunar Operation Command. And I had not been present at the Lunar Operation Command since I was processed out of the programs. When I went in and, um, you know, they did the blank slating process, you know, debriefed me, did blank slating to where I had no memory and reinserted me back in my life. Now I was going to go back decades later to this location. Okay, this is, this meeting, I was not prepared for everyone who is going to be present. A lot of, for some time, the secret space programs, a lot, the small alliance had, they had gone underground because Sigmund had pulled me in and others and had done chemical debriefing to try to figure out if they could, uh, find out who was a part of this SSP alliance or if even there was one. They didn't know at that point if I was telling the truth. And they went through a process. They gave me a chemical, held up a, an iPad device that had a camera on it that was watching my eyes and facial expression. And when I re would recognize the photos they were going through, it would identify the photo. And it, they identified a few of the SSP alliance leadership some of whom ended up perishing or disappeared. So uh, when I showed up at this meeting and I walked in the room, it was very shocking to see Sigmund sitting across the table 
because he had been missing for a while and I had speculated that he, maybe he was trying to infiltrate this group. And when I saw him, I pretty much said exactly that. And he, he got extremely reactionary and started um, screaming at me that I had no idea what all he had lost. He had given up everything to be a part get of this. Get it again, you'll get that one. Yeah. So one thing I just want to point out here, in case some of you do not know Corey's tale, what we're dealing with is the Roswell crash happens and other things like it. The military industrial complex gets UFO technology. They colonize our solar system, but then they build a second space program that we're calling the MIC program. And those guys only get to stay in the solar system. They don't think ETs exist. Sigmund was a member of that group. Corey was a member of a group that actually was interplanetary, interstellar, and was going outside of our solar system as well as within it. So they have tried. Th these people were clever enough to come up with two programs so that they could disclose one eventually, and hide the other one. Sigmund was the main guy that they were going to use to disclose that partial program. But then this whole drama took place where Sigmund ends up finding out from Corey that the bigger program does exist by doing things like hair analysis and things like that. So I was told to go to a specified location at a certain time, and I was going to be picked up by the same type of craft that was picking me up before, a triangular craft that fit two people in the front, the crew, and then had three seats in the back for passengers. It's about the size of an SUV, or a little bit bigger. I sat in my car for a while. It wasn't a location I'd gone to before. And I, at some point, I see a white ball or orb in the sky, and it's moving around, and it came closer, and then the orb got bigger and bigger, and it looked like a sphere of light, and then it popped like a bubble, like a, a bubble you would blow, and there was the triangular craft, this, the dark craft. So I was picked up, and very quickly, we were, in, uh, we were at the moon. It, the moon went from being you know, real small to it, it grew real quickly, and then we were not far from the surface. And then we angled back around to that 10 o'clock position on the, on the back of, um, on the dark side of the moon, and we flew over a crater, and it was the crater that I knew that the Lunar Operation Command was in, but we couldn't see any buildings. It had the technological masking up that created a, um, a kind of a mirage effect, and that mirage effect somehow reflected back, uh, I, I don't know exactly how it worked, but it prevented you from seeing the Lunar Operation Command. So, Back when I first saw the Lunar Operation Command and served in, in the 20 and back program, the Lunar Operation Command looked like a swastika because it was a part of a Nazi space program from you know the 30s and 40s. So they had built it out to make it, to break up the look of the swastika, which made a lot of the people that served there more comfortable. And then the, there was a, also a hole in uh, basically a hole in the middle of the crater that went down into a, like a cavern area. And what, it was explained to me later on, what had happened is that when meteors hit the moon, at some point the moon pushes back and the, and the energy goes this way and it compresses, I guess we'll call it the crust of the moon, and then it expands again, leaving cracks and rifts and also, it, the energy would melt it and turn it into lava. And that's where they would get these huge lava tubes because of the lack of pressure and gravity. And in those tubes, they were building out more of the Lunar Operation Command. And when we flew, when we flew in through that hole, you see the part of the base that is below ground, I guess you'll say. And it's the part I've described as a bell, kind of a bell-shaped, 
where craft go in and out. We have a cool animation that's going to play here, and I just set it so Corey will now be able to see what you guys see. All right. Do, what do I? Just hit push? the button again. Is that it? Uh, I think you have to. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to hit it again. It wasn't that cool. <laughs> <laughs> there there we, we go. go. More work of R Rene Armenta. And yes, that's approximately what it looks like. I guess you can see very down at the bottom the size of the dark craft as, as it flew down through the hole in the top. And there were two bays, one above the other. Uh, one was an entrance bay, one was an exit bay. And when you fly in, there are these the areas where, you, where they landed the craft, the pilots got out, and then the ground crew came out and just pushed it. It was floating above the ground, just pushed it into a conveyor system that then moved it and placed it in a designated spot. It's pretty interesting. And of course, I was greeted by Gonzalez, and he showed up wearing the uh, Air Force dress blues. And this is after pretty much everyone, especially in the programs, knew that he had been presenting himself as Lieutenant Colonel Gonzalez, and then I found out when he was outed that uh, he was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, but he was pretending to be Air Force. So I walked up to him and I said, so we're back, you know, to this ruse again kind of a thing, and he, you know, tightened up and, and, and kind of freaked out a little bit, basically telling me to shut up, so... And by the way, Gonzalez was the first person with the SSP Alliance that he met with when he first went up there, right after he finished briefing me on all this stuff in 2015. So Gonzalez is one of the long characters in the whole saga. Right. So we went down a few flights of stairs and into a smaller elevator. And uh, we were met by a young female. She was dressed in the same type of uh, Air Force uh, dress uniform. She had her hair up under a, uh, under a hat. And uh, she greeted us and she stated that uh, she was going to be our escort for the remainder of our visit. And she had all of the clearance to take us down uh, another elevator and uh, then she ran a, you know, a card and, and placed her hand under uh, some sort of a reader and the elevator started going down very quickly. So much that uh, usually uh, Gonzalez always tried to get, get me to uh, do a count, try to judge how fast the elevator's going so they could do the calculations to figure, you know, uh, when you walk down a hallway, count how many steps it is. And uh, he, he was better at doing that kind of stuff than I was. But I, there was no way to count the, how many floors we went down. Right. So I had skipped ahead earlier. We were taken to a conference room, and I was brought in. There were a handful of people who I recognized that were a part of the SSP Alliance and had been in previous meetings. And of course, this is an image that we had our graphic novel artist do, um, do for us, and it, this is very close to what Sigmund looks like. He has, interestingly enough, a guy I grew up with had a scar on his cheek from a water skiing accident, and he had almost exactly the same scar on his cheekbone. Right, and uh, when I mentioned that I had reported that he was uh, possibly infiltrating he jumped up and started screaming at me that you know, he had lost everything. And he looked at me and said, intuitive empath my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which had been Corey's job description when he right. was in the space program. 
So Gonzalez then gave a detailed and classified report about his um, series of um, meetings and uh, work with other beings through this Mayan group. And uh, it was pretty interesting. It mostly had to do with them doing their uh, psychological and spiritual healing on a lot of traumatized beings. Now, um, Sigmund doesn't believe that uh, the blue avians are real. He, had, he saw a video of the Lunar Operation Command, the first meeting, when the blue avians appeared and they had video of them, but he said that there's technology out there to make you see whatever you want. And it was kind of strange. He, is, he said that he was fairly sure that the Nordics were screwing with our heads again. And before I could find out what he meant by again, uh, the subject got changed. But apparently this Nordic group has been assisting us for um, hundreds of years, and they even helped us form the United States. And of course, I gave a, a briefing of uh, the meetings that I had had with the Anshar at the Super Federation and at uh, the Council at Saturn. And uh, I, I ended up spending three days with the Anshar in their city with Ari's family. And that was quite a report, too. Oh, already covered that. And there's our sneaky little guy yeah. hiding in the corner. Hiding in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Which we've heard, you know, there, there were multiple reports at the signing of the Declaration of Independence of a uh, Nordic-looking being there that they called St. Germain, who somehow materialized inside the room after they locked themselves inside, knew all the secret Masonic handshakes and everything, which he could just pull out of their heads telepathically, and told everybody there, you have to sign the declaration. You have to do this. It's very interesting. Yeah. So the military-industrial complex secret space program is made up primarily of the Air Force and the Defense Intelligence Agency. And I've talked in the past about how they have uh, slightly more advanced space stations in the IIS that are serviced by these triangular craft that we see all the time, uh, that we call the Tier 3Bs, but they're more advanced. They're electrogravitic craft that they, they go back and forth and they ferry um, astronauts and uh, supplies. Now, during, of course, President Reagan's, Reagan's time, uh, Star Wars, we had put up quite a few uh, space-based weapons platforms, one of which was the Rod of God. And their telephone-sized um, tungsten poles that were coated with ceramic and had the, basically the tail section of a JDAM. Uh, bomb that, you know, used GPS to uh, guide it in. And it was a kinetic weapon that was just dropped from space and the, I guess, the, the kinetic energy released um, a lot of energy similar to a nuclear bomb, but no radiation. What is being discussed is that the United States wants to declassify this secret space program out of a place of strength. And doing so, they planned on using some of these space-based weapons and exotic craft to take out North Korea. So Which is trying to nuke us. So I know a lot of people have been upset about that, and we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. But there really are elements of the cabal using this as a proxy state. That warning that we heard about in Hawaii might not have just been a warning there are reports that they did, oh, yeah. in fact, shoot a missile down that was coming in. Right. Right. And yes. then covered it up. Yes, it was all, uh, you know, a setup for a false flag and to, to begin that war, but not, in, but in a different way. So, um, so uh, Tom DeLong and his um, 
effort was discussed a little bit and uh, how the military industrial complex, some of them are behind it. Now, of course, this meeting happened, you know, before some more recent incidences. Yeah. And more recent when we found out occurred. that it's a Mylar balloon that they were showing as the picture of the UFO they had and then raised $2.2 $2 million on a Mylar balloon that's cost $6. <laughs> That's a great return on investment, yeah. as I said in my article. People give us crap for raising oh, money. Really? Yeah. And this is nothing. Right. What we've done is nothing balloon. compared to that. And we're for real. I mean, we're trying to tell you guys the truth here. So can you give a big hand for Corey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the time, what I was told is that DeLong's effort was being backed by the Air Force space program and that they wanted to use this possibly as an avenue of disclosure, but they did not want to go through the UFO community because um, the UFO community, they thought, had lost its legitimacy that we were all, um, you know, in fighting and we have all of our, you know, issues, which is true to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of that. And uh, they didn't, uh, they said that they didn't want to associate, you know, their um, disclosure of a serious space program with people that were talking about uh, visiting with eight foot tall bluebirds. I didn't think that was going to be a good mix. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we're going to do it out from under them. That's the point. That's right. And that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> Thank you. Sigmund himself said that he had helped infiltrate and pull disinformation operations in ufology back when he was a part of this program. It was a part of hiding the secret space program by making everyone think that it was aliens or speculating it was aliens. So they helped create, I guess, the giggle factor with talking about aliens uh, by some of their manipulations. But, uh, you know, they said that we had also been infiltrated by a, an Illuminati order that was trying to bring their um, alien god religion to us so that we would adopt it at a certain point fairly readily after they started disclosing things like Antarctica, uh, that there was an ancient civilization there and there were some under the ocean. And they were going to disclose that, hey, we're related to these people, so we have a divine right of kings it was all, you know, it was all supposed to play in together. And of course, yeah, our egos have gotten in the way and we've turned religion, religions out of everything, you, ufology. Got ahead of my slides again. All right, we're getting to, what is it, Oumuamua? Did I get it this time? Yeah, okay. Oumuamua, you got it. Give that man a gold star. <laughs> I don't, I'm not able to remember all the fine details that you can, that's for sure. Apples and oranges can be a pair, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they can. <laughs> so um, Sigmund stood up and he was very proud and he said, I've got a treat for the both of you and lowered a, uh, a screen that was one of those smart glass pads, but a larger one. And immediately, he started uh, showing video that at first showed flight telemetry that went uh, displayed very quickly, and then it went to, you hear, you hear audio, and it sounded like an old NASA transmission, a canned you know, transmission. You kept hearing an audible beep every once in a while. And then they were discussing matching the spin of the target and then counting down. Then they were counting the altitude and then mark when they landed. And it, that was pretty cool because uh, they had fired a, uh, launched a drone out of the craft, the shuttle they were in, and it caught video of them coming in and, and matching the, the spin. It was a slow, very slow spin that the um, 
craft was was in, and it had and when it matched, it was it was pretty cool. I already discussed that. So just the thing about the outer barrier, real quick, was it was I guess in 2013, right, that the outer barrier formed. Right. Or no, it was 20. No, it was after that. It was 2015. 15. Yeah. 2014, end of 2014, that's what it was. Mm. Eh, it says, and still, it says Gonzalez, but it should be Sigmund. Oh, that's right. All right. Yep. Um, Sigmund said that he led an expedition to a craft, um, and they wanted to find out who it belonged to. And he said, wait till you find out, uh, hear what we found. And then after the, the docking, you see um, basic ast astronauts that were going through some holes in this metallic-like dome. The, the whole ship was carved out of stone. It was uh, maybe probably a meteor that had been uh, cleaned up, hollowed out, and then built out on the inside. And there was a dome on top that was kind of a crystalline... It was kind of crystalline, but it was hard like metal. And it, ha it was shattered. It had holes in it from many, many collisions over eons of time. And uh, what they found was that this was one of the ancient builder race ships. Is this the animation? Is it yeah. moving? Yep. No, it's moving. So this is sort of a mock-up of what we were able to see. And the dome was about a third of the way down what I perceived as the front. Now, <coughs> excuse me, on the outside, there was a <coughs> coating of ice, and it was, it looked like frozen, frothy lake water, and there was orangish red stuff in, uh, like cloudy material frozen within it. Now, the, um, after the astronauts shimmied down through one of the holes, we have a scene. They had kind of like GoPro cams on their, um, on their uh, suits. Now, and they had flashlights on their wrists and uh, on their, on their uh, helmets and on their chests as well. And they were going through the inside of this craft that had zero gravity and was obviously very ancient. And they started commenting that uh, obviously it had been picked over many times by different ET races over the thousands of years who happened to find it, land on it, pick off, uh, you know, some technological materials. And let's point out also that you were getting this briefing on December 16th, just five days after NASA had actually announced this and said that it might be an interstellar craft because they're telling you there's a cigar-shaped aircraft in our solar system but they're not revealing yet that they have a space program, the secret, where they could go out and take a look at it. So we're getting this really valuable intel right now. So there were a lot of panels removed from the walls, empty cabinets. It had obviously been stripped. Now, at one point, we hear one of the men state that I found something, you know, please, you know, you know, not please, but, you know, vector into my location. And then the point of view that we had was uh, someone that received the message and started going through the um, floors. There were holes in the floors and they were weightless, so they're pushing their way through open floor sections to get to the correct level. And when they did, they found um, they were able to get into a room that you couldn't hardly see because one of the panels had kind of lodged in the way and you couldn't, you couldn't see the door. And when they went inside and the light spread out, you could see a kind of a semi-curved room, concave, and there were drawers like a morgue, but they were large. 
and they had already pulled two of them open, and there were dead or old dead bodies on these uh, tables that came out. And one of them looked, uh, it looked kind of like a pterodactyl. It was bird-like, and it was very light blue, almost white, and had been, obviously had been in there a long time. The other one they pulled out, at first I thought was a type of mammal, but it, when we looked closer, it was obviously it, it had been some sort of an aquatic being. And it had kind of a short torso, but its arms and legs were like tentacles. No, no bones, they were just like tentacles. And at the end of the leg tentacles and arm tentacles were three more tentacle extensions very similar to the uh, triangle. Well, yeah, this is, <clears throat> this is one of those weird things where, in case you guys haven't seen where this is going, uh, the, the craft that he goes into appears to be an original remnant of the Ra civilization, of the civilization that 2.6 billion years ago originated on Venus, conquered several, or colonized at least, several neighboring stars, and now is the, the Blue Avian race. And all of their records have been wiped out, uh, but what we're seeing is, finally we have a craft where the handwriting wasn't scratched off, he's gonna get to that in a minute, allowing us to analyze what it says. And this is so profound because now we're coming up to this big solar flash, this idea of ascension, which the Pyramid Timeline talks about, which the Blue Avians have been talking about, all of this stuff is interrelated. It's like the ancient past, the beginning of how this all started, the people that are contacting Corey now, we're now getting to see their technology in a way we never have before, including the bodies. And so this tentacly being looks a lot like the golden triangle head being that Corey saw when he was at the LOC for the first time. So that's probably the same being, but you know, many, many, many millions of years more evolved in the future. So some of, uh, one of them was still pulling open the drawers, looking, and there were you know, other bodies in, but I didn't get a good look at them. Uh, the one camera was focused on them trying to retrieve the bodies, and they had these big bags, um, orange bags, that they were trying to put the body in, and the minute they touched it, it basically broke up into tiny little pieces. It was like freeze-dried. And... Uh, so uh, pieces started going everywhere because you know, there was zero gravity. And the light is reflecting off of each little particle in the uh, camera shot. So um, the next thing you see is a guy, you can't see for a few minutes because it's everywhere. And then you see a guy using one of the panels from the wall as like a spatula trying to scrape <laughs> the being off of the uh, table that it was like, stuck to. Uh, they got it out in chunks and put it in the bags, um, but they they retrieved the bodies and uh, they were going. To, uh, I hadn't heard any results, but they were going to uh, cross-reference the genetic material, organic material found in the ice sludge, with that of the freeze-dried bodies to see right. if make sure they were the uh, former crew. So the organics, they were able to get some preliminary dates back to a little under a billion years old. And they were able to track the trajectory of the craft to the star, which they told me, and I forgot, that it was uh, in orbit for a billion years or so. So another part of the expedition called out that they had found something interesting. And uh, once again, the camera goes through different floors and you end up in a kind of a different looking area where this, uh, the floor and ceiling's a little bit um, higher, a little bit more of a distance between them. And on every wall, every ceiling and every floor are all of these glyphs. And some of them are real wispy and stylized 
And they said that that was a hyperdimensional mathematics and language that was mixed. You couldn't separate their math from their language. But, and, and they hadn't, they weren't quite able to fully um, figure out, you know, the translations. But the others, the second type of uh, glyphs were uh, dashes, smaller dashes, dots, and it was almost like a computer language type language. And they stated that they had found similar writing on Earth and in, on planets, on excavations they'd done to other planets, and they were able to actually, they were able to start deciphering the writings on the walls, which was more exciting to them than if they had found technology. Mm. So, I mean, right now, they are finding out quite a lot about the ancient builder race, and I can't wait to uh, go to that well, and, and just the gadgets that we're going to be able to pull out of this ship also could be really amazing. Right, but there wasn't a whole lot. It was right. mostly picked over. But this is the first time we had any type of writing or glyphs from uh, the ancient builder race. Keep getting ahead of the slides. Well, you didn't really say that it was also, the language is also found in other stars nearby. Oh, yeah. right. In, in local, in other stars close by where they had found ancient builder race ruins, um, you know, they had uh, found, I guess, later civilizations that had writings that were, were similar. It was uh, not exactly the same, but right. enough to where they had uh, like a Rosetta Stone. Now, at the end of this, Sigmund told me that we were going to go on a tour of the LOC Bravo. Now, one of the things I've kept quiet over the years is that there's not just one Lunar Operation Command. There's three. There's LOC Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. I've, at this point, had really only been to Al uh, Alpha, and that's the one I described to you that looked like the swastika. The others were mostly below ground. We were... Don't want to get a help. We got into another elevator and rode it down and then got into a, a long, skinny shuttle that held everyone present. We came out in another large cavern on the other side of that bell-shaped area that I had showed you, and we began flying close to... Um, it was inside a lava tube, traveling. It was on the other side of the moon, and we were traveling, basically, if you're looking at the moon, if you look back around at the 10 o'clock position, we had gone into the inside of the moon through the crack that I had talked about, the, the hole, but now we were traveling along this way, along the curvature of the moon, coming more towards the front of the moon. And that's when I saw, um, not only on our way to LOC Bravo, we started seeing giant, basically, tractors that were broken and looked like kind of like an excavation site where like a tractor broke and they just kind of pushed it to the side and kept going. Keep clicking because that's missing there. Oh, okay. So it was a small facility on, on the ground. There was sort of another hole, similar to what we flew into, but more oval. And then there were radiating out um, more uh, buildings that looked more like what you would see um, depicted as on the surface of the moon, kind of you know curved, long, elongated buildings that looked like they were um, um, raised by filling them with air. So we saw, this is the first time that I'd seen this, men and women walking around that actually had NASA symbols on their clothing. Until this point, I didn't think NASA was really aware of everything that was going on in the Lunar Operation Command, but at some level they were um, involved because these people were there studying ancient ruins. We were greeted by a few of the egghead types, and uh, 
they helped us get suited up in, in environmental suits, learn how the respirators, how everything worked, how the safety uh, mechanisms worked. And uh, then they took us down to what they called the Great Hall, which was where most of the artifacts were. And I tell you, it was very much like walking up on a scene from the movie Prometheus. There, was, there were ancient large chairs and seats. Some of them um, actually had bodies in them, ancient bodies in them. And the PhD, it was interesting, he was sitting there and Sigmund was trying to be in the limelight as much as he could. Um, the guy stated that soon I will be given the same tour to a major television network. And he, was, he said, Wouldn't that, won't that be something? But until now, you are getting the tour and you have to keep the, uh, the bulk of it secret. And right. it was a five-hour tour and at this point, I can only share just a very little, but when I'm able to share more, it's going to be very cool because some of your insiders, I think, have had this tour prior. It seems like it. And right. you had never even mentioned before about giant chairs with giant bodies in them. That's, that's new information for me. Right. But it fits with the uh, people that were on Mars and blew up the planet that became the asteroid right. belt in our solar system where it's like 70-foot-tall humanoids. Yeah, they weren't that big. But oh, the 35 foot type, you think? They weren't that big either. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. But, um, yeah, I can't get that specific yet. But, um, See, I'm trying, though. I yeah, got him in front of yeah. an audience. He does. He tries. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and all along the floor, as if it was almost like a part of a track at some period, were shattered what looked like I beams that were made of that uh, uh, crystalline metallic material. Right, and if you've seen a lot of the other videos I've done on YouTube, you'll know that there are all these different domes and obelisks and cool structures of this crystalline material that we found all over our solar system, on the moon, in all different places. And these huge tunnels went off in all these different directions, lava-type tubes, and all along them were artifacts. Uh, mostly random things that would be used and building, you know, nothing real exciting. Well, I guess that's, a, you know, pretty exciting, but, you know, not, no real eye candy other than that. And then I was uh, talking with Gonzalez, and I asked him, have you ever seen anything like this? And uh, I was told, you have been here before, you just don't remember and apparently in my third 20 and back, the one that I have very little memory of, I was helping uh, expeditionary teams go through and catalog everything they were finding. I, I had no memory of it. And for those who don't know, we have actually multiple insiders who've talked about this, the idea that there is a program where they will take you out to work for 20 years in space. They have time travel capability, which they got from extraterrestrials, they bring you back to the time you left, and then they age regress your body. So you get dialed back to the age you were when you left, and then they block out that 20 years of your memory as much as they can and try to splice it together so you don't remember leaving. So apparently some people are having this happen to them, and Corey is one of the very few who, like 3%, I think you Three said. 3 to 5%. Was, right. That actually get total recall where they remember what they did. So he's had three of these 20 and back tours, which technically makes you like 106 years old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I turn, but officially, I turned 48 here in a couple of weeks. So. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I, was, I went on a tour that I had apparently been on prior. You're right, that we didn't even talk about this recently on Cosmic. We were taken on a uh, small train system, uh, a very small train system, that was looked like it was built for tours. I mean, it was obviously built to take you around different areas. Uh, it's, it's very cool. You, we, yeah, the tracks went all around these different uh, structures that had been just shattered by some sort of a concussion wave. And uh, at the... Um, at the end of the tour, we 
went back. We were allowed to shower because we were just soaking wet from wearing the uh, environmental suits. Mm. Um, we put on the clothes that we ar had arrived in, and Gonzalez and I were sent uh, to different uh, back to different destinations. Uh, and you thought you were going home. <laughs> yeah. But that's not well, what happened. Actually. Or did you go home that yeah, time? Yeah, I went home that oh, time. Oh, okay. So overall, the when I was giving a briefing to the, SV, um, to the, to the uh, SSP Alliance, I was giving them information about some of these major meetings I had gone to, including the Super Federation, where a major milestone was met, where um, human beings have developed to a point to where we are not going to have ETs pretending to be gods coming in and manipulating our DNA and our spiritual development. From here on out, we have developed to a point to where we take over our own management, and we're going to... Yeah. yeah. It's a very big development. Right. It's, a, it's a very big deal. <laughs>